Okay, so on Monday, we started the first set of lecture series. Okay. We introduced the three lecturers that will be with us throughout the week. On Monday, we heard from Dr. Katauka, currently teaching at um, Sofia University. And today, the second lecture will be presented by Dr. Mauricio, Rufino Mauricio. Let's all welcome Dr. Mauricio. Thank you very much. You know, when Dr. Katauka was speaking yesterday, he started off by saying, you have to excuse me because I'm sick. And I, I'm going to apologize today and say the same thing. I cannot be standing for a long time, so most of the time I will be sitting, which all I do. That's a problem with myself and Dr. Katam Kaiten. We went to the same school and we got old, right? <laughs> well, no, you are younger than I. Uh, so you're all students of who is your teacher and what is your class? Okay. Are you studying cultural anthropology or just in general migration studies? Okay. We also uh, have anthropology. Okay. So That's it. Uh, today we'll talk about Nanmato. As Osama Dr. Katauka has uh, took us as Austronesians, as Micronesians from the Southeast Asian countries all the way to New Guinea and Solomon Islands and then turn again up north going up to the Micronesian areas and he covered a lot of ground and I, I want to thank him for, uh, for that uh, because uh, to discuss only one part of the settlement of the Pacific region uh, you tend to miss some things. And do any of you remember what happened uh, when the Austronesians were traveling through? Why couldn't they make it to Micronesia or did they make it or what was the problem? And then that's our first part of the question. Second part is what enabled those Austronesians to get across to us? You remember the Pacific Islands, Polynesia, Melanesia and Micronesia? The islands get smaller and the distance be between each of those get larger, right? So given that problem, what, what is the solution? What, 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 what did we do? What did we invent that enabled us to travel long distances and find smaller islands? Okay, we've got navigation, we've got some of the best navigators in Micronesia and the Polynesian area, right? <coughs> and then there is innovation in the transportation, in the canoe. I think the making of the double hull canoe enabled people to travel long distances and knowing what stars to follow, knowing the feel of the waves, and the direction of the winds, not only know them in general, they know very specific uh, things about this. Those things enable us to uh, to have expert navigators and travelers over long distance. So, Austronesian that became us, Micronesians, were part of that movement. I think we can claim that our ancestors or people who were uh, related to us in time, were responsible for bringing us here through knowledge of the skies uh, and also uh, the transportation was changed. Okay. I just want to let you know that a continuation of what Dr. Kataoka has started. Uh, no, I don't mean I mean, Katauka, where is he? <laughs> uh, he's, he's in the back. 
Anyway, that's, uh, we will be studying, or we will be talking today about oral, some oral histories of Nanmato, and then some archaeological work that has been done there. So you have the archaeology of Nanmato uh, combined with oral histories of Nanmato. Both topics are brought. <coughs> Scholars like to argue about them. Uh, some of their points are very well taken, at least for me. Uh, some of them are not. Okay, as a means of uh, introduction to all of us before we get into, there are certain oral historians that I will point out who were partly responsible for all of the oral history knowledge that we know of today. And by the way, I gain knowledge about Nanmado not for directly from somebody who also get direct history from their parents. I read a lot of oral histories, especially <coughs> the collection in Hamburg, a German ethnographer who was on the island in around 1910. He was here for less than a month and he collected over 200 narratives in Ponope, wrote them down in Ponope, and then leave them in one of his work, 1936 work. Uh, in addition to him, we have, uh, how should I say, he was an American, and the Ponopians called him So Kyo, but his name was Cho Kyo, and he apparently came from the eastern part of U.S., came to Ponope at Lord, then get married to a Tupunuai woman by the name of Litakana. And he has two sons, Richard or Ricard and Louis. These two sons became oral historians. And Chokyo apparently was also a known oral historian. Where did he get his knowledge from? I'm not sure, but I think he partly got some of it from his wife, the member of the Tupun Tupunuai clan. And of course his sons are also Tupunuai. So Louis, their father Cho, and Rika were our well-known oral historians who recorded what they learned. And they recorded this through Hamburg, a German ethnographer who was here in 1910. We we're lucky to have an ethnographer like that who was able to record these things in front of him. Of course, their stories are spelled like a German, uh, different spelling, but I was able to uh, read them and understand them. So uh, if you have a chance, read, uh, I think, Hamburg's volumes are in our library. If you ask them, they can. And then uh, there's, of course, Lowell and Bernard. Does any of you know about Lowell and Bernard? There is a book he wrote that is called the Book of Llewellyn. And Llewellyn Bernard's grandson is Masao Hadley. Maybe some of you know him. And Masao Hadley is by far the best oral historian of Nanmado. He was special because he learned from his grandfather the layout of Nanmado and the islands. But he himself visited, he was doing archaeological work in fact. He visited those islands and he collected artifacts from them and he learned stories about each of the islands. So I will leave you with his work and keep it because one day if you want to learn more about Nanmador, you can look at the map in the back, see the number and the number corresponds to the numbers where the name of the islands are and what the function of the islands are. Not all of the island, but Masao was able to uh, write down some of the islands. Right? So you can, you can study it. those people who are doing film. I think this is something that you should, you should know or you should learn. Because if you go there and you, if you are documenting one particular island, it would be nice for you to say the name of the islands and say, in the past, according to Masao Hatli, 
this island function as such. For example, Peinaven. One of the islands is called Peinaven. Why is it called Peinaven? What is Arun? Arun is coconut, right? So a, pl a coconut platform. Can you detect? Uh, can you kind of guess what the function of that island? Obviously, light was important to them at Nanmadol at some point, and uh, coconut oil produced light in addition to others. So, the, one of the main functions of the island was to grind coconut, to squeeze it, and to heat it for for purposes of lighting, and then others. Uh, so, the names of some of the islands are in this one. You can look at the map and look at the island. Okay, I mentioned about Paul Hambrook. That was in 1910. He did the first map of Nanmadol. And he collected over 200 narratives in Polapen. Uh, uh, his map was based on another German ethnographer. Uh, well, he was not an ethnographer. He was in Pompey. The name of that person is Kupari. It was in the 1800s. So he attempted to draw the first map. And it was very, very rough and very brief. And Hamburg later expanded that map and make it clear. Uh, there was a, another foreigner who was on the island in 1836. His name was James O'Connor. He got a lot of tattoos on his body from some ladies in Nut. And he eventually got married to that lady. But he was the first one that I know of who visited Nanmadol. Prior to him, all of the sightings, or they only see the islands of Nanmadol from distance. And then in the late 1800s, there was a British ship that came to Kitty. And the captain requested the Sobhaji of Kitty or the chiefs of Kitty permission to visit Nanmado. And of course the chiefs of Kitty informed the chiefs of Madlani, there was this foreigner who was here and he wanted to. But he visited there and guess what? He excavated the tomb of Nandowas, the one that you will be visiting. And that was the first excavation that I know. <coughs> He was not an archaeologist, he was just looking for things, right? And among the things that he found there, obsidian, one piece of obsidian. Obsi obsidian is not native to us, as Dr. Katawako was saying. And of course he was brought in. And then one knife called Dakar, short one. And of all things, he also found the metal cross. Obviously, everybody was excited at that time, and uh, they claimed that maybe the Portuguese built Nandowas at least. Uh, they, maybe they wouldn't believe that we, we are able to do work like that. Uh, much later, in 1950s and 1960s, there was an anthropologist from <coughs> Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C by the name of Riesenberg, Saul Riesenberg. He visited Pompey uh, and went to Nanmadol and collected a lot of artifacts. And this collection still exists at Smithsonian Museum. You are allowed to visit that, but uh, you're not allowed to take it out. So we continue to ask them if we could do that. And then later on, Dr. William Eris of the University of Oregon and myself and Osamo Katauka are all Dr. Katauka. We are students of Dr. Eris. And uh, William Eris was the first to do systematic survey, systematic excavation of Kanadwa. All right. Any questions on that introduction? I think that's good enough for us. So we carry on a long scholarly tradition of studying Nanmato, but we are archaeologists and what we do is we do survey, we do mapping, and we do excavation.
Uh, I think some of you have seen some movies about excavation. Any of you have seen, uh, what's his name? Uh, that famous actor of... Indiana Jones? Indiana Jones. If you haven't seen that, go look at the Indiana Jones movie. That's a romantic way of looking at uh, his archaeological work. Uh, we don't go whipping around with the sad and all of that adventurous things. We do a lot of hard work out there in the field. I will be showing some slides of that. Any questions? You're getting ready to go to sleep, no? <laughs> you know, he's looking at uh, Any questions so far? Uh, you start with this one. Okay, you can see in the slides we, uh, I'll show you maybe five minutes or ten minutes of uh, a clip. And it's called Nanmadol from the Sky. And of course, the gods sent Nanmadol and they will take Nanmadol away, so we start with that. <laughs> okay. If you haven't been to Nanmadol, how many of you have been to Nanmadol? Okay. Oh, there's another one in the back. While we're waiting for this, I wanted to introduce Jason Parnabas. Can you stand up? He's with the Pompeii Historic Preservation. There's two, and then Jason Leben. And they are. Jason Levan is a good archaeologist, excellent one. Jason Barnabas is a good cultural anthropologist now. Uh, their responsibilities are to go out in the field, <coughs> and, uh, find sites, collect information from the remaining oral historians. Okay, the video cannot be... Okay, and I just uh, play another one. Just anyway, the aerial view of Nanmadol from the sky. You have the drones these days, and they make things a lot, um, I wouldn't say pleasant. But viewing Nanmadol from the sky <coughs> is much different than when you actually visit the site. And when you do the pictures of that, and, the, and so part of the oral tradition of Nanmadol that I just learned, that apparently the site where Nandawas is present time uh, was observed by oral historians from a mountain top. That's a, a bird's eye view of where they wanted to construct Nandawas, especially. Is there? Mm -hmm. Anyway, let me go through this first. Uh, of course, archaeology is the study of our accomplishments in the past, right? And in the case of Pompeii, you think about you think about two things: historic archaeology, that is the colonial period, archaeology about colonial period, and then before the colonial period, we call it prehistory, and we have. The date from 2,000 years ago, that's when we think, and we got radiocarbon dates, that is around that time, the initial settlement of Pompeii was. So when you do from 2,000 years ago until 1800s, you're doing pre prehistory, prehistoric archaeologists. When you do the colonial period from 1800s onward, you are doing historical archaeology. Now we know all of us, people who work in these short preservation offices, we know that anything that is 50 years old are historic. They have become part of our history and they shouldn't be uh, messed with. They should be preserved and we try our best to keep those. Uh, so you have historic archaeologists, 
And we have the prehistoric archaeology. Okay. There was one time I uh, presented a paper here. I believe I did that. It's about archaeology as a science or archaeology in the service of science. So what does it mean by why do archaeologists call themselves scientists? Okay, there are certain things we do that falls within the realm of science, right? When we do chemical radiocarbon dating, for example, you will have to know something about chemistry. You have to know what, what chemicals are, how are they relate to archaeological work. So that part of the uh, archaeological work, uh, carbon dating and whatnot, is called uh, archaeology in the service of science. Then you have the physical chemical dating methods, ways and means of reconstructing past environment and climate. How would I reconstruct or how would I as an archaeologist try to reconstruct past environment? What kind of things would I be looking at? Okay. One good example is pollen. When you get the dispersal of pollen from trees, they are buried in the soil. Okay, you can pick those up, identify what kind of trees these pollen uh, came from, and then reconstruct. If, uh, for example, if there were no, no hibiscus anywhere in one place, and then all of a sudden, maybe a thousand years ago, you collect the pollens and you identify that. So if the hibiscus is not there anymore today, you can say 1,000 years ago there were hibiscus here. So you are reconstructing part of what happened in the past, right? So that's uh, one way of studying. Reconstructing the landscape, climate, flora and fauna. And then remote sensing and geophysical survey. We do a lot of survey, survey work, but um, our work we do things on the ground. But now with the drone and with other uh, approaches, uh, we can do survey that will give you layers of what's on the ground, right? If there is a buried site, that kind of survey will be able to give you where the location is. Uh, a more detailed discussion of this is in the realm of um, Jason LeBen's expertise in uh, reading of aerial photos and satellite images to find ancient sites is also uh, we are able to do that now with the modern technologies and other. What we do at Nanmadol, and part of our archaeology of Nanmadol, is we try to find dateable remains, wood, burn wood, in the ground. Because you can then take that sample back and have the expert read the uh, carbon within that sample. And by reading the, uh, the carbon in there, we, will, we are able to calculate the time for that. And then one interesting one is a chemical composition of building materials. One recent study by McCoy, an archaeologist from New Zealand, he took a sample of one of the rocks from Nandawas. Now, a very thin sample, it's not uh, a major breaking of the rocks. And then he went back to New Zealand, abstract or find out what the chemical composition of that. And then he took one from Bussein Malek and did the same thing. And he found out that they match. The chemical composition of rock from Nandawas matched the one from Bussein Malek. What, what can we say about that? Or we can say that some of the stones at Nandawas came from uh, Bussein Malek. So that's an example of the reading of chemical and comparison of two areas. So 
that for us are archaeologists is important because we are pinpointing the quarry site or the areas where uh, the construction material came from. Uh, what is also interesting about this, uh, oral histories indicate that a lot of the stone flew from somewhere in Sokes, especially, uh, I wouldn't say especially because they didn't specify. But oral, history, oral histories claim that uh, building materials of Nanmadol flew from here through magic and went all the way up to all the way up to Nanmado or Nandawas for now. Uh, we have to be careful about this because uh, of course I will claim that see our oral history is accurate. We indicated long time ago that the stones flew from uh, Sokes or somewhere here and then they went flew up to Nandawas. Uh, you or as a scholar I can get into problem with trying to <coughs> interpret what the archaeological findings are in terms of the oral history. I'm comfortable with interpreting it as such. But there are other scholars who will question and who will uh, discuss all of these things. Uh, we have Dr. Katauka has spent a lot of time on identifying the food remains of Nanmadol. What we collected from the garbages in Nanmadol, including fish bones. So far he has identified a lot of fish bones and the kind of fish that we found there uh, through the archaeological record. There. We identified dog bones. And we also identify rat bones. These are prehistoric evidence of animals that were here before. So you can you can start to collect some. Uh, how, how, how would I put it? Okay, how many of you know the story of Lian and Sokala? Oral history. Uh, maybe not. Yeah? Uh, there was once two brothers who went up to Nanmatol. They went up there and saw uh, a dog. And they wanted to have the dog. What they do is they came back, kill their mother, and take it up to Isogar, in return for the dog. So they wanted the dog and they killed their mother, the turtle, and take it up there for... So apparently from then on, the ceremony of Nani Swami Sap was done without a dog. It was the turtle that was used instead of a dog. Two things, at least for me, dog predated the colonial period. The date from that is quite clear. Uh, the other one is that that happens because of the brother from Net who took the turtle up and then in exchange for the dog, they brought the dog back. And there is one uh, island of Nanmadol called Itet. There is a mound there that is excavated and they found uh, dog bones and, uh, not, not dog bones, but uh, at least on the, the bottom of that, they found a lot of turtle remains within that excavation. And the story of the dead is that the ceremony, ritual for Nani Sohan Sap, was done there. It's always at the island. So do you visit uh, the dead? Uh, remember this story. And also remember that we found dog bones in the archaeological record predate the colonial period. Goats were brought in by, uh, by foreigners. And so our, we, we suspect chicken was here before. Pigs are brought in. Uh, cows, carabao, and all of, all of those animals were brought in. But the dog, we're finding a lot of their bones in the archaeological record. Okay.
Okay, we put together a series of dates for Pompeii based on our archaeological work here. And the time period we put for the Nanmadol settlement and the work of Nanmadol is between 81,000 and 1,500. One unfortunate thing is we cannot find evidence that uh, a war occurred according to oral traditions and Isokalgal conquered the South Village uh, and take over. Uh, and that began our land market period on Pompey with the coming of Isokalgal. So there's no archaeological record indicating that that really occurred. Uh, if we find something like that and we can date it, that's going to indicate to us that this really occurred. So we're relying on oral histories. The reason why the South Alu dynasty was no longer exist, and even the title South Alu was rarely bestowed, but uh, the value bestowed quite recently on somebody. Uh, and Isogal became the first, uh, the first uh, landmark of Pompey. Uh, at this time period, we find in the archaeological record, record use of pottery. Then we find uh, the South Alo era. Center of activity was at Nanmatol, of course, center of influence. And we, uh, we calculated roughly that uh, based on the size of house platforms that we find on some of the islets of Nanmadol, that Nanmadol as a large area could easily house 2,000 people. If there were at one point 2,000 people staying at Nanmadol, you can extrapolate or you can think that the population of the island must have been very high. And then in addition to that, there is a lot of energy given out. There's a lot of people, means a lot of work. Work on Nanmadol itself. Large population, elaborate residential places. Some of the large house foundations are found at Nanmadol itself. In other parts of Pompeii, like in Kitty, uh, in the Wene area, the larger the place is, the, more cl the closer it is to the shoreline. As you go upward, the house platform tend to be smaller. So I think it's the same situation now. When you do a sapaka, when you go and work the uplands for your, uh, your livelihood, the house you have in the upland is always smaller than the one you right? You go there only on occasion. And so we, we found uh, evidence of that uh, occurring in the past too. That's part of our land tenure system or part of our the way we do use the land. Next. Uh, any questions so far? We're still combining archaeological records and oral history talk about both now. Now look at this view of Nanmadol. You know, it's too bad I couldn't show you. This is an aerial view of where? <laughs> Nandawa. is right. And then where else? Tau. Tau, right. Kondarak, right. Pala. Pala, right. You are among the filmmakers, right? Uh, are you with the group that is making the uh, movie of Nanmatos? No? Uh, well, you have a lot of knowledge of this area. Uh, the seawall, what's the name of that? You see the large wall on the outer edge of the... That's called Nanmalu site, right? Because you have Dharmalusai, Nandawas, Kontawas, Pandawas, Tao, Palang, you have uh, Kontarak there, 
And then you also have over here uh, We've got one interesting name here, uh, the small island, uh, can you have the pointer? You have, yeah. Go oh, yeah. here, so there, that small island is called Palang. What is Palang? Palang means chalk heaven, right? Or something like that, literal translation of that. Apparently Masao Hadley explained that as the center of communication for all of Nanmatol and also all of Pompey. Center of communication. They used drum and they used trident sawi. Okay, when when there are certain ways of using the drum which people can hear in a long distance and this means uh, something. So the Pompeians are no longer practicing that. When you use the horn, there are certain ways of blowing on it that will let you know, okay, these people are coming back from fishing, or the South Lord is dead, or something of that. You will announce a cheer to all of the people in Nanmato. <coughs> Nanmato is about one mile long and half a mile wide. So it would be easier to hear at Nanmato, but then some other uh, communicators somewhere else will continue to blow their or to use their drums. So as a result of that it's called Palam. Uh, tau. Tau means channel, right? And it doesn't explain what the island is. Uh, but apparently there is another island that is Paniot. It's located in that direction. It's an island by itself. And Paniot was supposed to serve as a place to prepare food for the people who were working at Nantowas, right? And they found out that's too far. The connecting uh, road was never completed. It was the responsibility of who is a member of the Bunuai here. Raise your hand. Ah, it's supposed to be a joke. Members of the Bunwai were responsible for that unfinished wall or unfinished road. So as a result of that, they didn't use Peniot as a food preparation place, and they used Tau as a food preparation place. And then one of the islets, Kontarak, uh, Pondat Kontarak, <coughs> or farther over there. Kontarak. Okay, Kondarak is part of a dance where you start fooling around. You know, you, you keep when and then you jump down and you do all kinds of that. Kondarak. But apparently, when they have funerals at Nandawas, then they would, they would do a dance, a funeral dance. And part of that dance, uh, Kondarak, now that we use it, is the name of the island there. Uh, Um, I will show you close up pictures. Of, um, but there is only one thing that I want to say about uh, Nandawas, Nanmalusai, and then the deeper water that you see in the, in the foreground here is where Kanemoiso is supposed to be. Underwater city. And a lot of people are still looking for the existence of underwater is city, uh, kind of so. In this. Anyway, at uh, uh, Nanmalusai, uh, there is an opening in the seawall uh, entering there. Apparently, in the opening itself, there is one big rock that is served as a foundation rock for that all of the structures in this area. And uh, there's one prayer, or you would say uh, a magic spell or something of that, called 
Kintakan Malusai. Kintakan Malusai means the person who brought that, Lamboy Sok, say that magic word to the rock so that it will protect uh, this area from uh, being destroyed. Uh, I think you heard in the, in the Bible there is a Monopoeian word that is used. Chakain uh, Pukakain, the stone to hold the foundation. And they, they use that to describe, I think, part of the biblical uh, cities of Middle East, something. Chakain Pukakain. So that one would be Chakain Pukakain, that is placed down here. And the magic spell of in that and what you say goes along with that. Now listen, this is part of the oral history. Can I archaeologically prove that? Yeah, maybe I can type down there and find a large stone there. But uh, is it written on it? Kintak and what you say? No, not, not at all. I, I, uh, this is something that oral history supply. Uh, it's probably an interesting tale of the area. Okay. Next one. Okay, Ramadul means places in between, spaces in between. It's an ancient complex of city. Now I, I put in parentheses town, because Nanmadul being referred to as a city is problematic. There is a definition of city that require a lot more or quite different than what Nanmadul is. So maybe um, I would rather describe it, it's all up to you, not as a stone city, but possibly a, a town or something of that nature. But it is unique, it's different from any site complex in Tolpe, and I think in much all of the Pacific area. Uh, places in, be in between you have channels dividing the islands. Uh, and then we are finding evidence of burial areas in, in the last 1,000 years or so are located in the larger tomb areas closer to the ocean on both sides. Uh, and some of the older dates that we get are from Usanda and other islands closer to Tama. So if you if you think in terms of 500 years, Olosova and Olosiva built and Mato, only two individuals within a long time, maybe they lived to be 500 years old or so. Of course they, they are probably humans, but they, they don't live that long. Archaeological evidence is clearly showing that some of the islets are older one or one day or closer to Taman Island and the ones outside on the seaside and seaward, oceanward, are much younger than the ones closer to. So I would say, you know, within 500 years, generations of people probably start living as a small community closer to Taman and as time goes on, uh, they started expanding and building other. So, based on what we have, and we still need to collect more evidence, you know, between 1000 and 500 AD, or 1000 years ago, that's when large buildings and large effort, large energy was expanded or given to the, the construction of Nanmatol itself. But the problem with that is that for some reason they completed the entire place or near completed and all of a sudden, all of a sudden they abandoned it. And we have yet to figure out why. Does anybody have any, any guesses as to why they abandoned a nice place like that? Nice tomb, nice houses, and close to sea. We don't know. Apparently as a result of war. Uh, 
but all of these trees indicated uh, that there is a war between a group from Koshrai coming down to Pompey, conquering the South Coast. But was it abandoned right after the war? Or was there something else? Um, archaeological record can help us by studying the human domains to see if there's some kind of a sickness that occurred uh, in the past that caused them. Uh, it's very possible that you have natural uh, events, typhoon, uh, any of those can also cause the abandonment of the site. <coughs> so the location is there and it is 92 islands that are made of made up of land. And remember, it's spread over one mile long and about half a mile wide. So when you visit, see, Nandovas is now becoming synonymous with Nanmato. When you ask visitors, where did you go out? I, I went to Nanmato, but we only went to Nandovas and look at the tomb. So we, we have to keep telling them there is more to Nanmato than just Nandovas. That's okay. That's Toman Island, and you see the location of uh, uh, Nanmatol on the east coast of that. Next one. Uh, there are the 92 islands. Well, uh, the area is divided into two: Matol Towe and Matol Pa. The resident of the south, South Oluru, is in. Matulpa Administrative Center at Tankatra. And then Matulbo is more ritual. You have more periods there and whatnot. Okay, the tourist routes. Uh, more recently you have most of the tourists are taken on the red red line. So we don't go from Toman Island, go around, and then you go to Andawas. Or you come through Someone, and you stop at the end of Next one. We have apparently a fleet from Kataupeji. We think of Kataupeji possibly including all Yap Island and Chuk and some of the Melanesian areas. Could, could also, we don't really know how extensive Kataupeji is. But uh, there are two brothers, so the oral history is clean. Uh, they came to Pompey, landed at uh, Sokes, in front of the Yupan. Uh, and they tried to set up their ritual center there, or their ritual place. It didn't work out, so they moved from there. Uh, the name of those are Olusoka and Sipa. Okay, their religion, what is known as in Pompey, uh, Pongisa. It's the worship of the land, and then it changed before they got to Anmado now, to Naniso and South. Probably the same belief system, rituals, but they changed the name in time. Uh, and Naniso and South means they worship the animals or turtle, and in addition to the land animals that they have at that time. Next. Oral histories indicate that at that time there are only three, three municipalities in Pompey uh, and they are Papaluk, Malan, Kopalan, uh, and then Kopalang. Kopalang includes Skitri, Papaluk includes uh, Sukes, and areas, and then Malam Kopalele uh, include these areas, Wanukpeta, Wanukpeti, Anuman, Vertao, Sanipan, Telo, Lapiset. Some of these names remain today. You know where Lapiset is like Lodz area, Sanipan you know where it is, then you have Lethao, and Anuman name the same. Wanuk is different. Uh, the present 
stay of U is called Wanuk. And it extends close to Tau uh, Chocolate in that. So they started their work at Sokes and they keep moving northeastward, moved to Wanuk, to Wanuk Beta, and then finally they found, uh, they decided to settle in uh, where uh, Armadol is today. You remember I, I had wanted you to see a bird's eye view as oral histories indicated some of the people here climbed up at a higher place. So what, what did they see when they climb up there? Knucks, if there is any. Okay, this is what they see. You see the place where the ocean is comes closest to land is the area where they constructed Nantawas today. Now you, you keep wondering, why, why did they do that? Well, what, what's the point of having to find the closest land area to the ocean? Ocean area means where the big waves come in and they crash on, on the shore, right? How many of you believe in ghosts? You? Uh, all of the oral histories that we have indicate that Ponopens in the past believe that when they die, their soul goes someplace. Any different from Christianity, from Catholic? For me, I'm a Catholic. I mean, they could tell me, when you die, your soul will go somewhere. Your body will just be thrown away. So maybe it's the same belief that drive these people to set a location closest to the ocean. Because the place you go when you die, according to this belief, is you go underwater. You go there first, you get a trial underwater, and if you have a good voice, then you go to heaven. Otherwise, you go in the dark. So how strong is a belief system? in driving people's actions? That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, maybe as Christianity today, we do a lot uh, because of our faith. And I don't know, it's my own personal belief that for that reason, the soul of those people who would be buried at Dandalas will travel, go underwater first. Uh, who knows, maybe they provided food for them too so that their soul can eat what it was uh, But you could have other reasons why they constructed that there. Yeah, but I, I think it's for religious purposes or ideology. Okay, next. Uh, construction. Sure. Well, one of the mysteries of Dunmadol now is where did they get the building material? long prismatic stones and then how did they transport these to them. We, we have discussed a little bit about rock from chicken shed that is match a rock from Andoas. So it is possible that they quarried their rocks from here or somewhere far away and then they transported those to the, uh, to the place. And we will continue to see if we can do more uh, chemical analysis of the rock composition and keep comparing uh, from one area to another. Uh, we believe that all of the points at that time assisted in the building of construction of the Okay, well, also oral history is indicated when uh, one of the brothers died, Kulosa uh, Dutch came the first South Dolor. How many South Dolores do we have according to our tradition? 
How many? No, 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 that's... Uh, we know the names of 13 of them. That's from your description. Uh, can we be sure of that? We don't know, but... Uh, as our Hadley indicated that there are 13 names. I have the names of those. Uh, some of the names. Before the conqueror came and conquered South of And what was the name of the last one? South of The last one was called Sokonomoi. Sokonomoi means uh, he was demanding of the people. It's a cruel area for South of And there are some stories of South of who were cannibals and all that they were. So, Southerners, Monmoy, they begin with Kudira, and then they ended up with the, uh, demanding of the people there. Maybe. They were cruel to the people they became. Next one. Oh, okay. Thirteen. First, Southerners were peaceful, the last ones were mean, cruel, and demanding. You know, part of the archaeological work, when you do a very accurate survey of the site, you will be able to reconstruct in the computer's three-dimensional view of some of them. This one is Pankatra, and we got the largest foundation of a, a meeting house. Or, uh, this one is very large, and we try to put a roof over that. Next. We estimate that the conquest of the South Lord dynasty occurred within this time period, 15 to 1600. So Isogar conquered South Lord within this time, and the Portuguese are already on Guam, right? So did the Portuguese see? Zogargal's canoe coming down from, maybe they cross each other on the way from Koshrai to Pumpi, right? Uh, no, but when you think about the context, historical context of foreigners coming into us, like Guam and Saipan, within a uh, uh, relatively short period of time, um, there are uh, what are these two two versions that I know of about the conqueror? Apparently, he was from Katau Petak. Uh, it could be Koshra, it could be Kiribati, it could be Pingala. Many of those can fall within. And a group of 333 warriors just come down and start fighting with this out there. There are some oral historians who believe that uh, there was a conspiracy by chiefs and Pompey to overthrow the South Lords themselves. So it's possible that Isokalgal was actually from here and probably was given to mission to you go kill that, uh, that person. Uh, pick which one you you believe. But the one that is most popular now is that Isokalgal came down from Katao uh, now what happens when Sokolov came down? No, you are getting too too stupid. So anyway, from the time of Sokolov until now, there are 27 non-marquees of Maclean. You can remember the names of those. Next one, so we won't put them to sleep. This is uh, West Wall of Nantawas. And for those of you who will be going there, that's a nice wall. Uh, go back, go back. On. Uh, look at the flaring on the corner, right? All four corners of Nantawas get this tilt up, flaring on that. And you know the purpose of that? I don't. But I think it has something to do with the, with the strength or the, uh, it's up to you. Anyway, there was an interpretation some time ago that this flaring is, is uh, Imitation of the pagoda, you know, the Koreans and the Chinese and the Japanese even. <coughs> Dr. Katawaka, this 
flare and corner. Does the uh, Japanese have a cortex? I mean, this architecture. Stories. Yeah. Four days temple with the big, big Yeah, right. Seven hundred twenty seven eighty. Yeah, but Nandawas is is built in twelve hundred fifty A.D. That's the age of. That's the most accurate radiocarbon dating of Nandawas. So you are you are calculate twelve hundred. AD to now is how many years? And it's still standing. Anyway, the flaren reminded me of one interpretation that monopanes cannot do a large project like this without any equipment. So it must have been built by Chinese or something like that <laughs> because of the architecture. You know, they give us no credit whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next one. Okay, I, I wanted to show this. This is the north wall of Nandowas. Right? Uh, the height of the wall is about, what, 19, 20 feet? It's, it's fairly high. But look at that hole right in the middle of that wall. What does it remind you of? You know, some of the European castles or fortresses, they used to have something like this, to put their big guns through. Right? And maybe Saudaru was using some big, large <laughs> guns. <laughs> no, there was one oral historian who simply explained that when they are building these walls here, uh, they wanted to slip in and out some of the construction material. Because once the outer wall is higher, it would be hard for them to carry all the stone and enter in only one place. So they, they put the holes there so they, it's for ease of construction. And I, logically, I, I believe that explanation. Next one. Okay, just a closer, close up look at the wall. And this is like a, what you, uh, there is a name for it where you have one stretcher and then uh, smaller stones to uh, Nandawas is a very well made structure of any any kind of structure it will, it's, it's been standing for, for a long time. Next one. Well okay, that's one of the inner corners but you see that long basalt uh, prism on top. Okay next one. There's a lot of students in the entrance to the uh, Otherwise, you have one wall, outer wall, another one, and then these two concentric walls and close the tomb. And this is the tomb that I mentioned. It was excavated by European captain of a ship, and they found obsidian in it, human bones, of course, and then a cross and the top of the Next one. That's the tomb. Next one. When apparently when Von Pence, uh, one day were being buried in a tomb like this, when there is somebody in, in it already, they cover it up. They, they put stones on top uh, and then large Sakao stone in front of the opening. So, um, I put this one in here because one of the prismatic stones on top of this is 18 feet long. That's a long one. Okay. Next one. Okay, you are at the ocean and you, you're looking at the seawall. Uh, at Narmalusa. Next. Oh, by the way, yeah, here. See this tree on the seawall? If you visit Narmadol for the first time, you should go climb up there, get a stone and throw it out toward the ocean. If you see if you see sharks coming in, then you jump. <laughs> if you don't see any shark coming in, don't jump. 
Okay, the reasoning for that is that if you throw, they come in and you jump, sharks will think that you are just another stone and they won't bother you. But if you throw and none of them show up, you are gambling. When you jump, they might show up. <laughs> so, <laughs> that apparently was the reason for it. Next one. Here is the entrance from the, uh, from inside. See wall entrance. Okay, when you do survey of any place, archaeological survey, uh, sometimes they would reconnaissance survey first. That is, if you go and you don't see any site, uh, but you want to cover an area where you will find site, you do a reconnaissance survey. And then when you find a site, you clear the site first, right? Uh, then what do you do? Katauka? Uh, you, when you clear the site, you map, map the site. Uh, all the features of the site. Uh, after that, you do surface collection. You go around and look if there are artifacts on the surface. You collect them. But you don't just collect them and put them in your bag or something like that. You put flags on all of them so you can measure them. You can clearly indicate uh, where they are. Uh, because when you do the mapping, you map them in there. Well, what's the reason for that? Why go through all of that? Because a lot of times sites are not disturbed, right? So if there is an artifact that is located Sakao stone and some artifacts. What would you expect to be with the Sakao stone? Right there. Would you expect a stone axe or would you expect a, No, of course you would expect some rounds, you know, tagantures of it. The context of the, and the relationship of artifacts to things can tell us a lot. Okay. But what happens if you find uh, bone fragments of human with a stone axe very close to the head. What can you say about it? Murder. Yeah, murder. That's that's very good thinking. The first thing you think about is look at the head. If it's cracked, then that stone axe was used to murder the guy. Uh, I'm giving you an example of the context of, of archaeological uh, artifacts to other things. And then after service collection recordings, you do a test, test excavation. And then when you come back with all the artifacts, you sort them out, you clean them. Then you analyze and you write reports after that. Next. Okay, this lady is getting ready to map a site. Noted her equipment, but the site is already clear. Next one. Uh, I was part of a group, myself and Dr. Katauka, in the 1980s. We cleared one of the largest sites in, in Nanmadov. It's called Panawi, and you, you face the Joy Island today. I think it's a resort now. Uh, but this, the height of this is about nine meters or higher than that. Then you look at look at the pavement. Look at the way. So that's the outer wall, a corner, a high corner, and then there's another wall on this side. Uh, I think this stated between. Uh, 11 and 1280. Well, we think that this island was not was not completed. They were still throwing corals as a fill after they built the wall. So you have a very rough pavement. On. Walking on this, uh, was very. By the way, we cleared this area uh, and exposed everything to the sun. And we recorded 100 something degrees. Uh, 
sunny days. So doing archaeological survey on a site like this is kind of demanding and you get really thirsty and get hot. Next one. 1980, there is that corner. And there is Dr. Kataoka and his assistant. They're like little pigs so compared to the rocks, right? Uh, they stacked up only four boulders. That's, uh, that's probably the greatest work that was ever done. Uh, and that goes up to uh, 11 feet or higher than that. 10 meters, yeah. Only four boulders. One, two, three, four. Um, I still cannot imagine. Uh, well, in this case, if you visit the site, it would be clear because from the height of that, it drops down, uh, inclined to go down. So when they started constructing this corner, they were probably rolling these uh, uh, boulders into place and then settle down. And many parts of this wall is starting to drop, starting to fall apart. And we need to do some renovation. Next one. Uh, within Anui itself, there is one tube that is constructed. You can see, you can see high walls, four corners, and then there is a tomb vault inside. And that's where we get our radio, radiocarbon dating material. And again, the pavement is very rough. And the project is starting to slow down. Next one. Uh, we did some. Um, excavation, and we sent out one of the islands. That's one of the very old islands of, of uh, Nanmato. Notice the person, uh, a lot of us are standing around. That's kind of typical, right? When you have too many people and only a few things to do. All of us stand and we tell the guy who is in the pit, do this, do that, don't. Okay, when you've come across something that is important, an artifact or a bone piece or something, you have to stop the shoveling and start doing it very little. So you won't disturb what is there. And that's what uh, this person is doing. Next one. Osamu, was that you, doctor? That's uh, Intaro. Oh, who, that's who was the head of the project in, uh, in Lengue Lenge yeah. last week. Right, right. Okay, there's another one. See this person is holding out the tape. That's because he's going to measure the distance from the wall to where his finger is, and then he will measure downward. So the person who is recording that will be able to indicate where the artifact is in the wall or in the hole. Right? That's excellent. Uh, next one. Uh, when you set up to map, you you use lines and uh, boards like that. You can you can be accurate about it. Uh, Professor re uh, required us to map every feature within a site accurately. Next one. Well, here is one of the Nanmatol sites, but I put it in there so you can see. The walls of the site is, are there, and then we have to indicate, map all of the artifacts. Thanks. And there is that young archaeologist at uh, Dallas. <laughs> yeah. He's also participating. He's looking for things. <laughs> uh, how many of you went out to Dallas? You did. Good. Next. Uh, here's another picture. Why did you put the lines in there? What? Uh, you know the grid system? These are needles. They're what? Needles. Uh, okay. Test excavations are usually one meter by one meter. You can you can have that without the grid. 
but in an area where you can potentially find cultural features that are buried and extend beyond what your one meter. If you find within your one meter some kind of a pavement, house platform, and it extends beyond your one meter, then you go ahead and excavate the other, the other one meter. So that's a good thing about uh, uh, the grid system. That is, uh, Any questions on so far? There is something about this that uh, I want to find out from you. What did you see in there? The one that uh, the person in the blue, blue, he's looking at something. Puddles, right? Uh, and they are just puddles. Okay, if you remember that when we, when we do uh, burials these days, you stand the bottles up, either the bottom is stand up, and they tend to be in a row. It's not the case here. So I don't think it's a burial. It's some kind of a garbage. Maybe they just dis discarded the bottles because they're not. Next. Now there is an excavation on one of the islets of Nanmadol called Itet. This was done in what, 1980s, I believe. And there is a mound there where they, uh, they cook turtles for ritual purposes. That is, they catch all of the turtles, bring them in here on one occasion, they kill these turtles, and they feed a moray eel that comes up within the uh, a platform now within the uh, hole in the heated area. And they tend to cook them at the same place over time. So you make them out. And then the radiocarbon date from here is, I think, 1218. Next. Oh, by the way, go back. Uh, oh, it's not very clear, but you can see stratigraphic layers here. There are some red, uh, not red, but white in this case. Those, I think, are from result of cooking all the time, they are ash. Next one. Okay, the kind of artifacts that we find are stone, made from basalt stone, hatches. They are very rare. There are more shell hatches than the ones that are made from stone. Next one. That's one of the islands of Nanmadol is called Tapa. And it was excavated, it was worked on by an archaeologist called Steve Athens. <laughs> and he collected these uh, Yeah, there, there are two good ornaments. Maybe they are bracelets. Uh, but we found a lot of these in our excavations. Then we have fishing lures made from shells. Nanmadol also. Then we have these pendants from Nanmadol. Uh, see they are, they, they, they put a hole through parts of these. Maybe you can Put it on your, uh, wear it as. Next one. Then we have smaller beads like this. A lot of times these kind of things are found in burial areas within, uh, close to the body or on the body. So, next one. Then a lot more of cutting tools like straw shell axes. These are more numerous in Pompeii than the ones made from stone. Next one. Okay, I want to have um, the Hambrook collection. 
of oral histories. The name of the person who gave Hamburg stories, the number of stories they have, grand, and then specific localities. Well, and Bernard, she contributed 100 uh, narratives. It's from Rentu Kitchi. Luis Kyo, the one who contributed 54. Uh, Saurugin Sokola, 53. Tupulak is from Nanipur Nach. Nanabaskiti or Wazakulam, 36. The one who is from Rohit Kitchi. And then Ricard, Ricard Tokyo, the one I mentioned, Tibunwai and Tamuroi, Kanagan Tamuroi, and then you have one, I think he was an American of Matlan, Silte, Elte. Tibunwai next. Then we have all of these other contributors. Um, I want to recognize and thank these people because without them, our knowledge of Namatol will not be complete. And I would encourage you people, you will be writing the history of our island in the future. Uh, do your best to write or to show them videos. Uh, and then make sure you look at the previous oral historians that have worked out. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Katauka for expanding our knowledge into other parts of Southeast Asia, especially uh, to us as students. And the staff of the Pompeii State Historical Preservation, they have done quite a bit of work in terms of archaeology, oral history, they continue to. And then Dr. Takuya. Now, Katauka and Takuya sound similar to me. Uh, he has collected, probably, he has the largest collection of Pompeian stories. And he's putting them on YouTube. Uh, you, can, you can find the names of these oral historians and they will tell their story. Uh, he has also participated in a lot of archaeological projects, uh, not only in Pompeii, but other parts of, of my nation. And I think I better stop here before I put you all to sleep. It's only 1.30 now. Uh, and uh, well, I will open it up for questions. Sorry that I couldn't stand uh, with you. Anything you want to find out or more? Yes. Those large panel stones, they, they, you know, they probably wrote about the impact. They came from, do they know where they came from on Pompeii and any idea how they were transported? Uh, we haven't done any uh, chemical analysis of the chemicals within the boulders. Yeah. And then we compared the two uh, or two. There is one area in Chamban, very close to uh, the Banu area, that has large boulders uh, within the within that area. So we suspect they are probably from there. From there. Yeah. Ah. You're starting to clap. <laughs> hey, yeah. Yeah. I want you to ask about that obsidian rock. You say it's not common to point it. There's no obsidian rock to point it. What is the closest place where that obsidian rock would come from or can come from? Um, I, I'll have a uh, Takuya answered that because he has actually analyzed other obsidian from Pompeii and uh, pinpointed the source of that. Uh, for the one that was excavated 
And unfortunately, we don't know where that is now. Uh, but what can be done is to analyze and figure out what quarry or what area they came from. So, Zakuya, can you? Closest sources like outer island of Papua New Guinea. And okay, one basalt well, obsidian spear was dug up in Kapigama region. And that's the uh, obsidian spear I analyzed using geochemical analysis. And that's pinpoint to outer island of Papua New Guinea. And uh, during 1910 Hamburg expedition, uh, Nukoro chief also had similar obsidian spear. So there is sort of like uh, com I mean like to trading route between Pompeii and the uh, outer island of uh, Papua New Guinea through Kapingamalangi, Nukoro and Pompeii. You are starting your own route of <laughs> yes. settlement, right? <laughs> no, this is like during like uh, Namadol period. Yeah. Yeah, communication network. Time. Time. Uh, we also have a trading locally. Uh, you you you're familiar with the Sawe trading network, right? The Alu Islands of Yap and and other parts of the Chuk Islands. Uh, Similar thing may be happening at this time because there were people moving from south to Kapingamarangi and then to Nukur. Uh, we don't have any evidence of them moving closer to us. Now we also have obsidian in Mokot. <laughs> uh, you were supposed to wake your people up. <laughs> Any any other questions? Uh, Jason, can I interest you? Can I ask you for five minutes of your time? Okay, there is a there is a recent survey that is being done at Nanmado, and he was part of the group. The reason why they are doing it at Nanmadol is because they they wanted to know more about the siltation within the uh, within the islets or close to Terman Island, and then some of the channels are sealed over. So the survey will help them about this. And uh, what else can you talk about? It would be easier to use a map to actually interpret what. We sort of found out. Well, first of all, uh, World Nanmadol was inscribed under the World Entity in 2016, and it was inscribed under endangered list of order. So, what UNESCO wanted to work with foreign national government is to find a way to put it off of it so we can actually advertise as a world heritage. Now, we are encouraged to uh, produce some documents like management report, conservation report, on how to actually take care of land in order to be officially put on the inscription. So now, we, if you look at a map, when you work as an archaeologist or someone that works with a map, if you look at an aerial photo, from a bird's eye view, meaning look down from above, satellite view, you will see Nanmado, the, the problem now, it seems that siltation is one of the problems, and encroachment of mangroves. And just by looking at a plain map itself, like, let's say a Google map, you can actually tell some of the reasons why, where the siltation is coming from. First, we all know that there's a pathway that connects there's a path that connects the land to Chamon Island itself, where Nanmadol is located. That is also a problem. If you look on a satellite map, you can change the map on Google Earth and 
TMR you use ATIS in the terminal. You can actually tell where the settings are coming from. Now at first we thought the lag was the problem building up the generation of the situation, but it's really not the lag itself. It's also a contribution of the time change itself. When the uh, you know, when a uh, when when C search coming in, it brings in more too many sounds. Meaning uh uh meeting is a problem. So and crouching of the language itself is also a problem because it's it's growing more and more so the channels are suffocated. Now we have a trail that walking trail from land all the way to one of the most in that island, or the most popular one, which is uh, Yanto. There's a trail that was man made, not touring land matter construction. It was new. So it, it is also a problem. Now we're trying to put everything in one consideration. How do we, if we're planning to do clearing of the channels, right? But we need to put, you know, in mind that if we cut too much, we may expose too much and then crowd erosion and so forth. So right now we're working with a team. I think they were funded by U.S. Embassy, uh, along with the film crew here. We're working together to make a conservation management plan. And hopefully all the stakeholders are working on their end. Partners working on whatever it should be best practice we should be doing. So it's more of a conservation plan than an actual map. Well, I think that talks to me. I'll just stand here and do it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, the filming people. People who are putting together the, uh, what is it, the video or the documentary? Or? process of nominating the site uh, to the World Heritage. The stages of what we are, Jason talks about that, uh, and then some other interesting things. But if, if we can be of any help to you, let us know. I know you have gone through uh, requesting for permission, going over to the Navardi's place to get his blessings, and I just realized that the process is cumbersome, right? When you go to him, <coughs> protocol is you go through Nanakan and then to me. Oh, that's a second. So some, some of the traditional leaders are very understanding. Others are getting to be too strict. And if I have to go and then find out that I will not go see him, I will be upset. So any of that, let us know if we can be of any help. We have uh, some other assistant from municipalities and whatnot who can help us. So who wants to become an oral historian? You don't. <laughs> All right, uh, I know some of you, may, you, you will develop the interest later on. But uh, there are some funny stories. You know, most, if not all, of the Bonavins do not know what archaeology is. Needless to say, what an archaeologist do. So, on one of my trips here to do research, 
Um, I was out there looking for a site. I didn't have to wear any good clothes. I was wearing very old ones. Uh, and then I carry a machete. I, I do things that I used to do before I went to school. And then one sister of my mother came through on the road and found me, you know, with old clothes and all of that. And she said, yes, what? What are you doing? So I said, I was clearing site. And he said, you know, where did you go to school? Uh, I said, you know, I told her, and then she asked, what did you go, what are you studying there? So I try to explain archaeology and anthropology as much as I can. And after a long spill, she looked at me and said, why did you have to go out here? <laughs> why don't you just stay here and learn those? And I didn't have any answer, but uh, you know, I was going to... I was going to explain to her that it's good to compare uh, you know, traditions. And then she said, uh, what kind of degree do you have? At that time I was doing my master's. So I mentioned to her. And she said, hey, you go all the way out there to just to come back and you know, dirty, you carry machete. You are doing the same thing that you were doing before you went to school. <laughs> and he said, you know, my kids, my cousins, right? my kids, when they go to school, they will come back and they'll stay in the office with pens in their pocket, they'll wear shoes, and they will be much better than you. So she said, maybe your degree is for coconut hunting. <laughs> there is the guy with the coconut gathering degree. Uh, stereotype, uh, but she encouraged us to go to school. It's, uh, it's good food. And then other colleagues of mine, one of them, when I explain what archaeology is all about to them, you know, they kept thinking, where, where do we put this guy? So the closest group will be oral historian. So you are, you are not an archaeologist. You are an oral historian. So, so I said, whatever. <laughs> uh, we don't uh, we don't really understand some of these things, especially our parents. Yeah, you may expect to get answers like that. Why did you have to go and do that? <laughs> to study our customs and and it's very enriching for those of you. Uh, I think a lot of you are taking micronation studies, right? That's it. Maybe uh, if you don't have any more questions. Yes? I have one more question. I read somewhere that one of the, somebody excavated the uh, Nanmato and they found a steel uh, they found a steel uh, box there. Is there any truth in that or they just made it up? I think it just made up. Uh, or at least to me, uh, I don't know of it. I have not seen anything of that, uh, especially metal, uh, steel, all of that is, is hard to believe. But we found some anomalies in that metal, that Anui, the side I was. Um, we found one part of a uh, hand, it's only, only that. It's not within a tomb or a burial complex. It's just sitting within the pavement a little bit lower. And we didn't analyze it, but you know, you started to have questions like, well, this guy, what would happen? Did somebody cut his hand off and just throw it out? Or was it cut off when they were working on it? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, but then we have some scary ones. Eh? Like we were excavating a house, what we thought was a house foundation within the uh, center of that. And we went all the way down to the bottom and
came across uh, a person who was sitting. The position of we, we saw this one. So we said, no, no, let's put it this way. This is not usual. This is supposed to be a house, you know, on this. And there was one Canadian fellow who was with that. And, you know, he was down at the bottom, and all of a sudden you have a rock that hit him on the head. <laughs> He jumped up and he said, hey, let's go. Close this up and we go. <laughs> there is ghost around. But uh, when you find burials with that kind of position, uh, you, there must be a reason. So, and we don't know uh, what the reason is. Maybe it's just a ghost. Uh, yeah, archaeology can be fun. When we were doing the work in 1980s at Nanmato. One of our one of our people went out fishing, and then he speared one uh, parrotfish with a uh, spear. Spear, uh, it's old metal, and that fish came out of the rock and punctured his neck, went all the way through. We had to take him to a hospital, but then the community members indicated to us that we were doing something that we're not supposed to do. And then I was in Nanmadol in 19, uh, Salam, in 19, what, 1980s. Yeah, 1980. uh, then the oldest person there that we were gathering information from him. Uh, there was one site that he told us, don't go there. It's just simply not. And then we, yeah, About what? Huh? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, not not uh, that we know of. What we found, construction material of Nan Nanmado, maybe part of Nanda was, was was a very relatively shallow. But they are individual stones. They're not in any alignment. So. Uh, but there are still people who are looking. The valley is very murky down here. Uh, can't really see much. Anyway, when I was in Zalapogun, uh, all of a sudden the leader of that community passed away. And all of the claim was, blame was on me. See, you are not supposed to touch that and you went ahead and cleared the site without his permission. So you see now, he passed away because of you. And then my mother from one up called me up. Get your bunch of <laughs> You shouldn't be working in a place like that. Uh, it's a coincidence, but uh, it, it touches on people's belief and feelings about their secret side. Okay. That's it if you don't have any more questions. Kataoka uh, is your history. Oh, he's he's coming back. I'm hiding. My goodness, you are hiding away. Uh, and then we'll be here on Friday. And then we'll try to come in.